Hi everybody. I really am here. My surgery is over and I'm convalescing at home. I want to thank many of you for your cards and your meals and Carly and I are feeling very well cared for. Uh, today I am proud to welcome my colleague and my friend, the Reverend Dr. Gail Ricciuti as our guest preacher. Gail is now honorably retired in the PCUSA and a former co-pastor at Downtown Presbyterian Church, as well as a pro uh, retired professor of preaching and homiletics at Colgate Rochester Crozier Divinity School. So our question to think about today, our point to ponder, will be related to a video that Gail um, has chosen for us to watch this morning, or whenever you're watching this, may not be morning. So as you are watching and listening to it, I invite you to reflect on the Apostle Thomas. Remember, he was the one who did not see Jesus when the other disciples did after the resurrection. And they told him about it, and he just didn't believe it. He said, here's what I will need in order to believe. And he laid out exactly what, uh, what he needed to have happen. And a week later, Jesus appeared to him. And it gave him everything that he had said. Everything he said he needed, Jesus met those needs. So Thomas encourages us to offer up to God what we need so that those needs can be met. So with that in mind, the question for today is, what do you need in order for you to feel that all is well with your soul right now? What, if anything, is holding you back today from a feeling of joy, of well-being, and peace? And if there's nothing, then just sit and revel in that for this time. But it's something to think about as you listen to this. And I'll see you on the other side for our call to worship. When peace like a river attendeth my way, when sorrows like sea. My 
Please join me in our call to worship. Friends, we gather this day to celebrate life, the life we have been given by God, the life we share with one another in community, the life that Jesus gives in abundance. Let us be grateful for the joy of life and let us worship God. Our opening hymn is, Holy God, we praise your name. Oh 
Fortunately for us, we have a God who recognizes that we are not perfect and who does not condemn us for that. Instead of remaining distant, he sent his son to live as one of us, to experience what it is like to be a human being. Friends, this is the part of our service where we own up to the fact that we get some things wrong. But in our reform tradition, our confession isn't just for us as individuals. It is also designed for us as a community of believers to get ourselves realigned with God's plan for us. Please join me in our collective unison prayer of confession. Let us pray. God of grace and God of glory, forgive us when we forget that nothing is able to separate us from your love in Jesus Christ, our Lord. We confess that the distractions of life and the fear of death cause us to lose our trust in you. Too often, we live and act as if you are against us rather than for us. Loving God, forgive our sins. Help us to put our trust in you through Jesus Christ who died, who is raised, and who is at your right hand in glory. Amen. Friends, if God is for us, who is against us? He who gave us his Son now gives us the Spirit in power. The Holy One is in our midst, equipping us for life in the service of Christ. In Christ we are more than conquerors. For nothing in creation can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Therefore, we can believe the good news. Jesus offers us new life. We are forgiven. I'm reading from one of the letters of Paul to the church in Rome. Chapter 8, Selected Verses Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness, for we do not know how to pray as we ought, but that very Spirit intercedes with sighs too deep for words. And God, who searches the heart, knows what is the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. What then are we to say about these things? If God is for us, who is against us? Who will separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus? Will hardship or distress, persecution or famine, or nakedness or peril, or sword? As it is written, for your sake we are being killed all day long. We are accounted as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor death, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. The Gospel reading for this morning is from the 13th chapter of Matthew beginning with the 31st verse. Let us listen for God's word to us. Jesus put before them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed that someone took and sowed in his field. 
It's the smallest of all the seeds, but when it has grown, it is the greatest of shrubs and becomes a tree so that the birds of the air come and make nests in its branches. He told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like yeast that a woman took and mixed in with three measures of flour until all of it was leavened. The kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field, which someone found and hid. Then in his joy, he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant in search of fine pearls. On finding one pearl of great value, he went and sold all he had and bought it. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a net that was thrown into the sea and caught fish of every kind. When it was full, they drew it ashore, sat down, and put the good into baskets and threw out the bad. So it will be at the end of the age. The angels will come out and separate the evil from the righteous and throw them into the furnace of fire where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Have you understood all this? They answered, yes. And he said to them, therefore, every scribe who has been trained for the kingdom of heaven is like the master of a household who brings out of his treasure what is new and what is old. May God bless this to our understanding. Let us pray. O oh, Holy One, we hear and say so many words, yet yours is the word we need. Speak now and help us listen. And if what we hear is silence, let it quiet us, let it disturb us, let it touch our need, let it break our pride, let it shrink our certainties. Let it enlarge our wonder. Amen. Have you understood these things, he asks them. Yeah. They toss it off as if, what's the big deal? Methinks they haven't been listening very closely because parables are not quite that simple. The kingdom of heaven, he says, is like a weed seed, like yeast, old fermenting yeast, like treasure hidden surreptitiously in a field, like a merchant in search, in search of that one pearl, like a net that catches everything. When you really look at the laundry list, this mysterious kingdom is like a hot mess. So I ask myself, what do these little stories have in common? Good parables, you know, challenge the accepted meaning of things. They turn the known world upside down. They challenge the ways in which the religious establishment sees itself to be the standard or measuring stick for all God's people. It was easy for the church to make parables into little allegories that they could understand, little equations in which each character or object was the equivalent of people or elements in their own situation as a community but that's not how parables work. Each of these parables disturbs me. 
when I try to open my heart to it, even a little bit. Of course, that's the function of parables, not to make us comfortable. They give us a glimpse into the truth that Jesus' ways are so not our ways. They remind us that we face the same faulty temptations his first followers did, thinking that our own tight-knit band of disciples defines the entire realm of God. We dare not write off or brush past the humdrum details that Jesus used in order to teach. Ever notice how he wasn't puffed up with brilliant sounding theology to dazzle people intellectually? His teaching about the secrets of the realm of God was cloaked in small stories, in vignettes, so common that anyone listening could easily pick up the thread. One scholar, Paul Ricoeur, called the details of Jesus' teaching the scandalous disturbance of the commonplace. We aren't looking for scandal in a bread dough recipe or farming instructions or fiscal role models, but as a teaching about the realm of God, you might say that the scandalous commonplace creeps up and hits us upside the head. So as Chris Cuomo says on television every night, let's get to it. Jesus knew all the common prejudices of his day. On the positive side, concerning the grand and huge cedars of Lebanon, if you ever wanted to be likened to a tree, it's a cedar of Lebanon that you would inspire, aspire to. What most people, except perhaps for large-scale Saskatchewan mustard growers, would view as a weed, someone in Jesus telling plants intentionally, as foolish and contrary an act as one of us planting crabgrass or dandelions in our front lawn. The stuff is said to be like kudzu, mustard. It's impossible to get rid of. And the realm of God, says Jesus, is exactly like that. And on the negative side, there was the, quote, wicked leaven of the Pharisees, unquote. That sneaky, fermented stuff that works in the whole batch of dough, and once in there, can never be removed. Never talk to a first century Palestinian or Pharisee, for instance, about leaven. It was shorthand for a fermented substance detested by the religiously observant. And yet, Jesus says the realm of God is like it. Go figure. Have you heard tell of the clever mothers who bake zucchini cookies or beet cake or bean brownies and carrot pancakes, smuggling the despised vegetables into the dough where the flavor goes incognito and the nutrients get consumed. You may even be one of those sneaky mothers. The kids have no idea what they're ingesting. In a way, Baking bread always represents a subversive act. The yeasty God hides the very thing we assume to be hated, incorporates it right into the bread of heaven, the dough of the kingdom, the basic foodstuff of the realm. And then she says, take, eat. And not the little miserly crumb I've watched so many folks pinch off of the communion loaf. She has hidden this little bit of old yeasty leaven in a bushel, more than 60 pounds of flour. By the time she's made it into dough, this baker woman in this story has had to bring out every container in the house, 
unused buckets, old wooden troughs, just like Jeff Owens, a masonry contractor in Riverview, Michigan, who, when the pandemic came along, started using the wood-fired oven he'd built in his backyard to bake more than a hundred loaves every day that he gives away to senior housing communities, to his neighbors, to healthcare workers, and to people in need. They say it's the best bread they have ever had, and they are calling it love in a paper bag. And it's not merely about the yeast, but about the yeast that a woman mixed in, about this moment in the work of the baker woman just before she puts it to bed for the night to do its hidden work. Without the woman, we might have an interesting illustration, yeast in dough, but without her, there is no parable. Since there were already kneading machines in the ancient world, if the parable were only consider, concerned with the yeast and its effects, it could have been about yeast and a kneading machine. Instead though, Jesus tells us about the hard work of a woman or a guy like Jeff Owens who prepares a load of dough. Think of the strength and persistence required to knead all that dough. Punch it down, fold it over, punch it down again. Not the same old mass-produced bread according to an industrial recipe. Not status quo bread, but a feast of good things, bread with substance. The spirit that is holy keeps persistently using the least to infuse the earth with abundance and glory and justice and the aroma of rising bread. In two of the other parables today, the kingdom of heaven is likened to someone who sells everything to buy one tiny find, one valuable pearl or a little treasure hidden somewhere in a field. Here are images of fiscal carelessness. All of one's holdings for a single pearl and images of caginess. Buying a piece of land to get the treasure you yourself buried and that only you know is there. The merchant whose mission it is by definition to make money, not to sell all he has for one single pearl, acts counter to any good merchant's practice. Is this kingdom then like a poor financial manager? On the other hand, what would you give anything or everything to see coming about in this world? the end of war, racial divisions erased, poverty ended and the hungry fed, eroded land restored. What would you give everything for? And like a net tossed into the sea that catches fish of every kind, here we find the indiscriminate. Now note in this one that it's not the kingdom of heaven that then divides bad from good and throws out the bad. It is an indeterminate they. My hunch being that the early church felt they just had to add this interpretation to make sense of life and of this story as they understood it and as we too tend to assume, an implied reward for good, faithful folks and an implied punishment for others. But Jesus' own words were about the net that catches everything. 
So the kingdom of heaven, this unexpected realm of God, is shown to us by one who knows as wild and weedy, as contrary, extravagant, careless, cagey, indiscriminate. Would you have used any of these adjectives to, des to describe the realm of God? What do you see revealed in these disparate tales about the dominion of our God? Certainly not conventional wisdom, I would guess. Each little story subverts human culture's usual understanding about the way to live, what everyone supposedly knows. Maybe you find yourself stumped by these odd stories, and if so, perhaps we've come up against the trickster aspect of our God's work in the world. It is like something hidden in the middle of 40 acres, or indistinguishable in the bushel of flour, overflowing all the bread pans you can collect for it, or covered up like a single seed about to germinate and take over your yard. This dominion is more than anything else a riddle and a mystery. And entering it, we step into a realm that's ultimately out of our control, in which radical trust is required and outcomes are not in our hands. This realm of God is not only about letting go of our illusion of control, but also about embracing an element of surprise the kind of surprise so stunning you would sell everything you have to secure it or step outside of conventional wisdom to participate in it. The ultimate surprise is summed up most eloquently in what Mary Lee read for us earlier, Paul's words to the Christians in Rome. It must have surprised them as it still surprises us by running so counter to all we fear, all we assume about how we are or are not related to God. Who will separate us from the love of Christ? Will hardship or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or sword for I am convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus, our Lord. It's right up there with planting a single weed seed and getting a tree, or dropping a little yeast into a bushel of flour and feeding the whole neighborhood, or selling everything that weighs you down to procure one beautiful pearl. It makes no sense at all, and yet is the meaning at the heart of what we are called to practice together in community. The holy welcome extended unconditionally to the whole world. Thanks be to God. Amen. At the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow, every tongue confess him, King of glory now. Tis the Father's pleasure, we should call him Lord, who from 
the beginning was the mighty word humbled for a season to receive a name from the lips of sinners unto whom he came faithfully he bore it spotless to the last brought it back victorious when from death he passed bore it up triumphant with its human light through all ranks of creatures to the central height to the throne of godhead to the father's breast filled it with the glory of that perfect rest christians this lord jesus shall return again with his father's glory o'er the earth to reign for all wreaths of empire meet upon his brow and our hearts confess him king of glory now thank you gail I know everyone watching joins me in thanking you for giving us the reassurance that it's not just us. It just doesn't make sense, but that we worship a God who is radical and making God's own sense out of things. Now let us join together, finding that sacred space inside ourselves where we will take off the sandals of our metaphorical feet and stand on holy ground. Let us prepare for prayer. Please pray with me. Oh God, you are such a trickster in some ways, the ways that you bring us to a fuller understanding of what your realm, what your kingdom is like and can be like. Here among us, God, we have people who are mourning the loss of loved ones. We have those of us who are healing from physical stresses and surgeries and breaks and fractures and we have those among us who re have relationships that are struggling for life. And at the same time, we have many of us who are finding comfort in routine during these unpredictable times. And you remind us through the preaching of the word today that all of this is in your realm that you cast a broad net and it is never conventional, that we will see you in a bit of yeast, that we will see you where we least expect to see you, and that just when we think we've figured you out, you come to us in new ways. Thank you, God. Thank you for loving us and not giving up on us. Thank you for not being conventional and boring. Thank you for leading us through exciting times, even though they're challenging, even though we sometimes fall short. We know that you are there, finding ways to nurture us through the gifts of bread from mason workers or the gift of hugs from neighbors or the gift of meals from people who long to take care of each other. Over the years, Jesus, you have 
led South Church to develop an understanding of ministry, our acts of faith. And from the beginning, you made it clear to us that each should be non-pastor dependent. Pastor informed, pastor resourced, but not pastor dependent. And in this time right now, when this little pastor is recovering from surgery, held by the prayers and the love of this congregation, God, it is so evident that you have raised up leaders, leaders who stand tall, ready and able to preach the word, to lead Bible studies, to sing your praises, to reach out to others. And it makes this little pastor's heart glad. We give thanks for our friends, especially our preacher today, for her insight and her wisdom, for her willingness to be with us during these unusual times. We always give thanks for Andy and his ministry of music, God. It enriches our lives every week. And so here we sit in a nation that is on edge, in a world that is turning upside down, with the loss of great people who have returned home to you, like John Lewis. Our hearts are heavy with the sorrow of what has not yet been accomplished. And yet we rejoice with the things we have been able to do so far. God, help us to see that we are living in the kingdom of God, the kingdom of God, the K-O-G. It is the now and the not yet. We see glimpses today, and we are in the not yet. Some things fall into place today, but there is no fulfillment yet. The yeast has been planted, but the bread has not been baked yet. We are still a people in process. We are still growing and learning. We are not at the end of the arc of your justice in the world. And so we ask that you keep us mindful and keep us humble and keep us hopeful and keep us anchored in your love in your light, in your justice, that you continue to provide us with the Holy Spirit of transformation, the Holy Spirit who knows our sighs when they're too deep for words, the Spirit who comforts us, who inspires us, who advocates for us and encourages us to advocate for others. For God, we are your people and we long to be your ambassadors to this broken world. Put us where you want us and show us what to do. We ask Jesus in your holy name as we pray together as you have taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, for thine is the kingdom and the glory and the power forever. 
Amen. I think I mixed those up, did I? Oh, I'm not going to record it again. Just chalk it up to anesthesia brain. I'm not sure I got the ending of the Lord's Prayer right, but it was on the screen, so you should have gotten it right. And God knows our intention is right. Well, we began our service with a rousing and heartfelt rendition of our last hymn, sung by Nashville recording artists, and now it's time for us to turn and, and add our voices to the musical strains. The truth is that because of Jesus, because of the presence of the Spirit and God's unfailing love, we can not only say or sing, it is well with my soul, but we can also know that it will be well for all of our souls. As my grandmother used to say, it is well, it will be well, all manner of things shall be well. Please join me as we sing our closing hymn with Andy and then receive our guest benediction from Carol Santos, a member of the Penfield Presbyterian Church who is also a leader and a member in our Acts of Faith community. See you next time. Andy?
The charge and benediction. As we all resume our covert sequestered lives, let us remember that we are connected by the winds of the Great Spirit. Let us receive these words of great karaoke prayer blessing. May the warm winds of heaven blow softly upon your house. May the Great Spirit bless all who enter there. May your moccasins make happy tracks in many snows. And may the rainbow always touch your shoulder. Have, Have a, a great, great week, week everybody. everybody. See, See you, you next, next time. time. <laughs>